Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are located in the world. You're joining Sabrina Khan on FuelYourselfFabulous.tv. And I'm so excited today because I've got an absolutely awesome, awesome guest on with me. But before I go into the interview um, and introduce my guest, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about why I set up this platform and why I'm so passionate about it. Well, um, I really, my mission is really to um, get the message of health and wellness out there and be at the forefront of that and through that process revive the way that women eat, move, think and live because I do believe that we live in quite a vulnerable society at the moment where chronic disease and obesity is at an all-time high and I think a lot of these ailments can be controlled through lifestyle and food and I'm really a big believer in food as fuel and uh, vitality from the nutri from nutrition uh, and food really to heal um, and my own story really is that through a clean eating process a few years ago I not only lost weight but I you know got rid of my IBS which is a digestive problem that is rife in many many people and general gut health really is rife in a lot of people as well I got rid of my cholesterol without even knowing it I've warned off diabetes which definitely at my age I would have and it's something that runs in the um, Asian culture a lot and I also got over a cancer scare so that's why I really want to get the word of health wellness vitality out there and uh, yeah, really excited to have my guest on the show. Um, I've got Hannah Crum, who is the Kombucha Mama and founder of Kombucha Camp, which is the most visited website in the world for um, information on kombucha. Um, Hannah also mentors thousands of new and experienced kombucha brewers and uh, provides consultation services. You've got a book coming out early next year and I mean the list just goes on and on and in my experience I cannot go on to any health and wellness site now without sort of fermented foods without people talking about fermented foods so really yeah tell me how you got started uh, Hannah and where did you start your journey with all this well I first uh, came across kombucha while visiting a friend from college he had moved from the Midwest where I'm from to San Francisco and when I was visiting his place back in 2003 we got this really great tour of his apartment and he had a lot of things that have now become normal in my life but at that time were kind of weird and different to me so um, you know he had a filter on his shower not just on his drinking water and to me that was like whoa of course that makes so much sense get the chlorine off your body and um, and as we're going around his place one of the neat things that we saw on this little tour was a box and in the box were jars and the jars were covered with cloths and they go that's the kombucha I never heard of it I had no idea what it was it looked really weird with all these stringy things hanging down and we didn't even try it there. So when I returned to Los Angeles, kombucha was already in all of the Whole Foods and very easy to find. So I grabbed a bottle off the shelf and it was that moment, um, looking back, it was that moment where the heavens open, the light beam shines down, the angels are singing. And it was literally for me at least, love at first sip. Now, true confession, I'm the girl who snuck the pickle juice out of the pickle jar, so maybe my body chemistry was already craving that type of sour, tangy flavor. But when I had that first sip, it just electrified me, and I knew I wanted to drink it all the time. But like many people who first discover kombucha at the grocery store, the price tag was a little bit more than my budget could provide. And because I had seen the jars at my friend's house, I was inspired to try making it on my own. Now that was kind of outside of my normal personality because I wasn't at that time someone who cooked a lot or you know I was more a microwave cook or uh, I still hadn't really learned much about food or food preparation so it was kind of uh, interesting that I would start that type of experiment and for many years my husband thought I was crazy uh, but ultimately 
I continued brewing and I've been brewing now for over 10 years, but we found a flavor that he loved, pink lemonade, and that really got him hooked and turned him into a believer. And over time, that allowed us to kind of form a partnership and create a kombucha camp. Yeah, it's brilliant. You know, when you say you had a sip and you got hooked, I actually ordered some uh, online a couple of months ago and I love the taste as well. Tangy, sour, reminds you of like summer's day. Uh, here we have the horse races and it's like a non alcoholic, sparkly beverage. It is actually very, very delicious. So, health benefits aside, it's actually a very delicious, refreshing drink to drink. Well, and it has uh, historic roots. You know, humans have been consuming fermented beverages since we first found honey fermenting in the crook of a tree. So uh, humans and fermentation have a very intermingled history, a long history. And it um, it's because we really are bacteria-powered organisms, just like everything on this planet. You know, it's the healthy bacteria that live inside of our gut and on our bodies that help us do all of the functions that our body needs to do on a regular basis. And the same is true for plants. Bacteria are there helping them uptake nutrition through their roots. Uh, the smell of rain is created by bacteria. So our, our world is completely populated by all of these bacteria. And one of the ways in which we interacted with them was through the foods we consumed. Because not only did fermentation uh, preserve food that normally would have gone bad and we wouldn't have had available to us in the colder times, but it also made water potable. Mm -hmm. So in ancient times, water wasn't necessarily something that was perfectly safe for us to drink, but by fermenting it into beer, kvass, kefir, kombucha, all of these different drinks, we were able to consume water, get the nutrition we needed with the added benefit of all of the bacteria and the healthy acids and, and nutrition that they provide in a living form. Yeah, definitely you're right there because humans are actually, we're more um, bacteria than we are cells. So we've actually got more bacteria in our system than cells in our body. Um, but the story of fermented foods, from my reading and my understanding, especially a lot of around the Western A. Price Foundation work and uh, Sally fallon Morell, who's also been um, a guest on uh, Fuel Yourself Fabulous.tv, yeah, a lot of these uh, uh, were ancient traditions. So where do you think they got lost? Why did fermented foods get lost, um, Hannah? Where did, yeah, what, what happened? Sure. Well, I think um, at least here in the United States, what happened is the processed foods revolution. So um, after World War II, it became very convenient to have, you know, a boxed cake mix or a TV dinner or something like that. It became a treat to have food that was already made for you instead of making it from scratch. Unfortunately, over time, the quality of those ingredients and the quantity of those uh, poor quality ingredients increased in quantity. And that's really one of the big reasons why we have so much uh, disease and obesity and all of those things you mentioned at the beginning of the show because the quality of the nutrition that we're putting into our bodies is so poor that we're, we're starving. But the ironic thing is we're putting more and more food in our mouths, but ultimately we're not getting the nutrition we need. And the other thing that happened is when we kind of mass produce some of these products, we lose some of the microbial diversity as a result if it isn't pasteurized out of it. Yes. So uh, there are numerous different reasons why fermentation kind of fell out of fashion, but it, right now it's enjoying a terrific revival, thanks in part to Sandor Katz and of course the work of Western Price Foundation and many others who are out there touting their benefits. And what's really terrific is once people start consuming fermented foods, you don't really need much more convincing that they're a good thing to include in your diet. So from yogurt to sauerkraut to kombucha, we recommend getting a wide variety of fermented foods in your diet in order to give your body what it needs. Yeah, I'm all with you on that. And I, I've read some amazing sort of testimonials online, sort of um, uh, one of the one of the big kombucha suppliers in America that was healing of cancer with it obviously there's always this disclaimer and you've got a big disclaimer on your website as well we can't say that it, it's definitely going to heal but there is stories pointing that way that the, because of the general sort of health benefits but what are some of the health benefits that you know of and aware of with um, 
with fermented foods and kombucha and the bacterial benefits? Well, I mean, humans have known for a really long time that food is our medicine. Hippocrates said it way back when in ancient Greece. And so, you know, this concept has kind of been shifted in our current understanding of food and why we eat. A lot of times when I ask people, well, why do you eat? They say, oh, I'm hungry or because uh, it's social and fun. But the real reason that we eat is because our bodies require fuel, nutrition in a living form that we've evolved to recognize. And so, you know, what's really telling are some of the old names for kombucha. So, for instance, in other countries, the, the name will translate to miracle mushroom or mushroom of long life or uh, tea of immortality. So all of these names, while they sound fantastical, certainly are rooted in the recognition that when you consume kombucha or other fermented foods, that there is a real palpable experience of healing that people have. So while we never put any claims on kombucha because how it works in your body is unique to you, yes. and that's what our motto, trust your gut, really means. As we mentioned before, there's over 500 types of bacteria that live in our gut, but which ones live in your gut? We don't necessarily know. And so by consuming uh, this wide variety, we allow our bodies to take the nutrition that it needs. So that's why we don't often find a one diet fits all or a one you know, pill helps every single issue because every body is unique in its own way. Just as our fingerprints are unique, so too is your, is your internal um, gut signature as well. So some of the specific health benefits that many people report uh, receiving a benefit with when drinking kombucha, definitely digestion. Yes. You know, your gut is your engine. And in fact, we like to think of it as our first brain because the tissue in the brain and the tissue of your enteric system, which goes from the esophagus to the anus, is all made from the same tissue. And it's very rich in neurotransmitters and in fact has more so than the brain. And they're connected through the vagus nerve. So there's a very real experience that occurs at the gut level. And when your digestion and when your gut is out of balance, probably you remember this, Sabrina, after going through your own process, but your mind isn't clear and it's harder to think. And sometimes we end up craving things that are actually really bad for us, but because of the gut bacteria that are present there, in the case of candida specifically, it'll cause us to crave sugar, which leads to negative reactions, but it's that bacteria telling us to consume those products. So paying attention to the types of foods and the types of products we're putting in and on our body is really vital to not only our digestion, because then that extends out to our immune system. So your immune system is created in the gut. Part of why like babies are always putting things in their mouth is they're building their immune system. They're testing things out. They're seeing, is this something that's good for me or bad for me? Well, the bacteria that they pick up are then transmitted into their gut and the body either makes antibodies or not. And that's part of how our immune system grows over time. Yeah, I'm definitely for that. Um, all, all, every, all health starts in the gut. But um, what specific, you know, so in terms of, better digestive health, what specific sort of symptoms have people, is it reduction in bloating, is it reduction in cramps, is it just because they feel more healthier, more alive, more revived, sort of, is there any kind of specific benefits that people, you know, you know you've been supplying and obviously you're, <laughs> you're at the forefront of the kombucha and kefir revolution, so is there any specific digestive problems that people are reporting uh, with with this drink and indeed other sort of uh, fermented beverages. Absolutely, you know, a lot of the information is anecdotal, but it then leads scientists to do research on kombucha. And so, while we don't currently have, you know, the types of studies they usually do for pharmaceuticals, um, there is a lot of research showing how kombucha works in terms of specific uh, health issues. So for instance, a lot of the things you're mentioning are all symptoms of the same root cause, which is a gut and dysbiosis. So be that IBS, constipation, bloating, acid reflux, um, any kind of digestive issue is likely going to be ameliorated by including kombucha in your, in your diet. 
um, or other fermented foods as well. And then other things we hear about eczema, uh, psoriasis, all of these kind of autoimmune reactions, food allergies, asthma, are benefited when our body comes back into balance. Because more than anything, what's happening right now is we're so overloaded with toxins that our immune system literally can't keep up anymore. And so it's it's screaming out in pain and manifesting in this wide variety of symptoms, including diabetes and cancer and all kinds of things, because it's saying, hey, wake up, I need some help here. I need you to pay attention to what you're putting in and on me yes. so that we can start to get rid of some of that yucky stuff. So one of the things that kombucha does, and it has been proven time and time again, is it helps to remove toxins. So um, whether those are environmental toxins that you're absorbing through your skin or through the air or the, or the water you're drinking, or if they are toxins that are absorbed through the food supply that you're consuming, kombucha has a very specific effect in that it, um, it prevents cell damage when exposed to those types of toxins, including there have been studies showing that um, you know damage created by EMF waves and radiation is all ameliorated or prevented when kombucha is included in the mix. So many of these studies are starting to try to look at what are the underlying reasons for why kombucha does such a good job at this. And one of the things to consider is that kombucha is tea. Tea already has a whole host of known health benefits now we're adding fermentation to that mix, and what that creates, oh, and sorry, so kombucha is an acetic acid ferment like vinegar, so we know the health benefits of vinegar. People have been drinking you know, apple cider vinegar as a health tonic for many, many years. So when we combine those benefits of tea and vinegar together, we have this amazing beverage that not only helps with the digestive function, the immune system, but also creates healthy acids that supports healthy liver function. So one of the reasons that um, kombucha does so much to boost mood or prevent hangovers or things like that is because of the healthy acids created that support the liver so that it, the liver isn't bogged down by having to process all of these xenobiotics, all of these external um, negative influences, but it has actual support with those healthy acids created by the kombucha. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense, Hannah. And there's a lot of research, there's a lot of... Um there's a lot of ongoing research and interest in these areas, like all corners of the globe are at Russia and obviously America and it's Brazil and it's just it's it's just a really hot topic right now. Absolutely. Well, um, you know, these countries have long histories and traditions of fermentation and kombucha has been around, has it been 200 years, has it been 2000 years? In any case, it's been around for a really long time. and. You know, some people wonder, is it just getting popular now as part of a trend? Yes. Again, we think it's getting popular now because this is, people need it right now. And moreover, unlike, you know, poisons in pretty packages that have to tell you they're the real thing or that have to tell you, um, you know, how cool and hip and trendy they are with celebrities and this and that, kombucha really delivers on what it says it does, which is make you feel good. So some of the healthy acids that contribute to that are gluconic acid, glucuronic acid, hyaluronic acid helps with uh, beauty and skin. Um, also, we have all of the B vitamins present in a living form from the yeast present in the kombucha. And so uh, it's those B vitamins that really give you that feel good energy boost. So some people will report a slight feeling of euphoria sometimes from drinking kombucha. It's very similar to if you're getting a vitamin B shot or taking a niacin flush or something like that, that influx of nutrition that your body instantly is able to use gives you that energy boost, gives you that good mood. And with all of the, the balancing that it does in the body, it's no wonder that people are reaching for kombucha again and again and eschewing the other beverages that really don't give them anything other than a taste sensation. Yeah, and I've got to vouch for that because like I said, I actually ordered some bottles and as soon as I drank it, you just I was just like, whoa, revived. Um, so, so even it's fermented, so obviously there's some kind of sugar that goes in it. Is it a help? Some people are going to think, oh, there's a lot of sugar in it. Is it good for me? Um, what happens to the sugar when it's fermented? Kinda. And this is a yeah, this is a question we get all the time. And here's the thing to remember: you know, one of the things we try to remind people of is to consider the source. And that's the source of your food. That's the source of your information. Anything that you're going to consume, 
think about where that information is coming from and what kind of motive might be behind it. So um, in the case of um, sugar, we have very much a negative perspective on sugar and all sugar is bad, when in fact all life requires sugar as fuel in order to survive. So as an extreme example, um, you know, our DNA is made up of a sugar phosphate backbone. Now granted, that's not the same as table sugar, but it indicates how crucial sugar and those crystals are uh, for our bodies and our nutrition. So um, kombucha specifically feeds on sucrose, which is table sugar, and that is a molecule of fructose and glucose. So the very first thing that happens is the yeast start taking the sugar and they cleave it from a disaccharide into a monosaccharide. So the fructose and glucose are now freed up and they can be utilized by either the yeast or the bacteria to create those healthy acids, gluconic, glucuronic acid, all that comes from the glucose present. So it's really vital that we're using the sugar for the fermentation process. Now anyone who's ever made it at home, if you first taste your sweet tea and then a week later taste your kombucha, you can tell that the sugar has definitely been converted because the flavor is not sweet at all. And the longer it ferments, the more of the sugar is converted and so it has a lower glycemic load when consumed which is why especially if it's been fermented to a point where a lot of the sugar is removed it's a great beverage for candida sufferers and for diabetics because it will help to reduce that glycemic load and make it easy for their bodies to to deal with that um, and because of the improved liver function specifically for diabetes it helps the body when processing uh, the different the different sugars so that you don't get those same spikes We've had many people say anecdotally that they've been able to reduce their insulin or reduce their medication as a result of including kombucha. And again, we don't attribute that just to the kombucha, but oftentimes when people start drinking kombucha, they're also doing other things in their life yes. to make them healthier. So kombucha is just one of many things that contributes to overall well-being and health. And I know I've read various reports about, um, obviously, you know, there has been some negative information about kombucha as well. I mean, I'll, I'll just be straight up and, you know, obviously we're having a frank conversation here. And, but, but when I dig deeper, it's because people have tried to ferment themselves and obviously there's been some contamination down the way. So how easily is kombucha available? And if people want to start brewing you know themselves I know you've got a lot of videos on your site um, I know you do a lot of e how videos as well so if people want to get into this drink then how you know where do they start what do they do well and you're 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 voicing a lot of fears that people have around fermentation and really the fear is coming from lack of familiarity as I mentioned previously, kombucha is 200, 2,000 years old. I mean, how could a culture like that survive all this time if it was something that was easily contaminated or caused harm to people? People would stop making it. They wouldn't pass it on to their friends, and we wouldn't be drinking it today. So just like preparing any food at home, provided we're following proper sanitation, there's no more risk to making kombucha than any other food. And in fact, oftentimes it's safer. So kombucha, as I said before, is an acetic acid ferment, and it's also an acidified food. What that means is our typical pH range is 3.5 to 2.5. The pH of stomach acid is like 1.5. So it's very, it's very similar to some stomach acid in that regard. And that's part of why it does such a great job with your digestion, because those acids help to break up the food particles and release the energy easier than if your body has to do all the work on its own. Um, so that being said, those healthy acids, there have also been many studies showing that um, they kill harmful pathogenic organisms on contact. E. coli, salmonella, listeria, many of these organisms when they come into contact with kombucha are destroyed because of that low pH. It literally like cuts through their cell membranes and breaks them to pieces. And so this is what we call um, isopathy or light controls like. In this case, the healthy bacteria and acids in the kombucha are keeping the bad organisms in check. And that's really what we need and why the antibiotics haven't succeeded where um, probiotics and healthy bacteria have. It's because when, they, when the antibiotics come in and kill, they kill everything, the good and the bad. Yes. Unfortunately, what happens then is people's bodies will get out of balance. Yes. And so when we are putting good bacteria and good acids back into our body, we're, we're, using, we're using nature to help control that as opposed to just destroying everything. And the real problem is 
is because bacteria are so flexible, um, as soon as their cells break, that DNA can be captured by another bacterial cell. And this is how we've seen the evolution of superbugs, is because bacteria are so incredibly evolutionary and flexible, they'll just pick up those those strains of um, those bad strains of bacteria left behind from the um, from being you know killed with a with a antibiotic or a cleaner and just evolve into something that's even stronger and more viral. So really, I think the research is starting to show, and I'm really excited to be in this time right now with the American Gut Project, the Human Microbiome Project, all of the research that's coming out and showing how vital it is we have the right bacteria in our bodies doing those jobs. So it's it's really safe to make at home. It's um, almost like sticking your hands and rubbing alcohol in the sense that it's it's very sterile once it's reached that low pH. But of course, we do also want to pay attention to our sanitation, making sure we're using clean implements. And really, all of the kind of fear stories that are out there, it's like one or two isolated incidences, and most of them can be traced to other causes um, rather than the kombucha itself. Well, that's that's a fantastic explanation and I'm very excited about the, the human gut project and all the research that they're doing around the microbiome as well because I think it's, I think, you know, in Chinese and Ayurveda, gut health is actually key and if you're not regular, you think that there's something wrong with you but in sort of the Western, you know, UK and the Western world, it's fine to have a stomach problem all the time. It's fine to feel bonged and bloated all the time so yeah i think that's a lot of crucial points you just mentioned there um and do you recommend i mean do you recommend if people are taking probiotics they should um they, they should replace it with these more natural kombucha kefir or they should carry on with their probiotics or do they both go hand in hand because obviously probiotics are a must to to balance the your gut health. So what's your opinion on that, Hannah? Sure. Um, well, we, you know, everybody, everybody has to tune into their own body and listen to the biofeedback it's being given. So um, what's what we're seeing now is that so many people are taking um, probiotics. And unfortunately, the definition for probiotics, at least in a legal sense, uh, here in the United States as to what you can put on your label is very confining in that there's only a few strains that are technically considered probiotic. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't a whole whole host of other strains, probably many we don't even know the names of that are beneficial for our bodies. And so we've also seen an instance where now people are overdoing the probiotics to the point where now they have too much acidophilus in their gut and things like that. So again, getting a variety of fermented foods, getting them from natural sources is going to be the best way to get that diversity that your body needs. But, um, you know, we don't like to should on anyone. We let people make their own decisions. And again, that's what trust your gut means. It means that um, you listen to the feedback your body's giving you. Now, Here's something that happens sometimes when people first start drinking kombucha, and that's called a Herxheimer reaction or a healing crisis. So this can happen whether you're adding kombucha or some medicine to your diet or anything, wherein the body will have a reaction that appears to be as if it's gotten sick. But in fact, what's happening is the old toxins are being released. And so your body has a reaction as if it were ill, but in fact, it's just the residue of what's leaving. And so for most people, what we recommend with kombucha, if you're new to it, is to start first thing in the morning on an empty stomach, have four to eight ounces, that's half a cup to a cup, and listen to your body and feel how it works with you. Uh, for me personally, when I drink it in the morning, I'll be walking the dog and I have my drink and there'll be one point, you know, five, 10, 15 minutes in where I feel my stomach just release and relax, and my organs relax. And when we look at the root causes of disease, their diet and stress, that, that relaxation is so vital for keeping our cortisol levels down and for reducing the stress in our bodies. And, um, and then you repeat that one to three times a day. So kombucha is something we also think of as a tonic in that it's not necessarily, you know, get your big gulp <laughs> size beverage and, and slam that down every day, but have small, frequent um, tastes of it throughout the day. And that gives you, it's like a little instant vitamin shot. It gives you what you need when you need it. 
Also, we find that some people, when they first start drinking kombucha, will feel like addicted to it and they get worried about that. What we say again is if you are drinking the kombucha, you're having a positive res response and you're craving more, your body's likely just trying to rebalance. And so allowing it the kombucha it needs is going to, over time, gradually reduce because when the body comes back into balance, your cravings for it will be dialed back as well. So. In answer to the question, you know, how much should I drink? It's like, well, how much, how many hamburgers should you eat? How much uh, yogurt should you eat? Your body's going to tell you that when it's had enough. And that's what listening to that biofeedback does for you. And I think once you look, you can't really stop. <laughs> and and then, then in terms of like, because a lot of people will, well, what if I'm really sick or what if I'm pregnant or, you know, people with compromised immune systems or children, can they have kombucha? I mean, our short answer is yes. And again, it's listening to your body. So for instance, I had a friend who really loved kombucha. She got pregnant. All of a sudden she couldn't stand the smell or taste of it. Well, then your body's saying, don't have that right now. Whereas other women have told me, oh my gosh, I craved it so much. I drank it all throughout my pregnancy. And in fact, when I was breastfeeding, I found that it helped allow the breast milk to flow more naturally. So we've heard all different types of experiences from different people. And so again, it's trust your gut, listen to your body and let it tell you what you need. No, that's a fantastic motto. I completely get it now. I completely get it. And very often, you know, people make things complicated because your body does tell you what you need. I stopped eating a lot of protein when I was training and I could tell that my body needed protein because I was just like shrinking away. I mean, I'm shrinking now anyway because I can't train because of my arm. And when I was eating too much of it, my body would burn up. So again, at the same time, so it, it's very true. And all holistic healing does tell you that, that you have to learn to listen to your body. And very often you are actually a better doctor for your own body than a, than a, than a doctor is. Well, nobody knows what's been put in it or how it feels or what's going on than the person experiencing it. And so, you know, and it's also remembering we have millions of years of evolution encoded in our DNA. There's all this wisdom and knowledge that, you know, we evolved with. And for us to just throw that all out the window because the label says healthy or low fat or whatever is, is silly. And unfortunately it's, you know, it's a testament to how well marketing and propaganda and things like this work. I mean, look, we've been back and forth in the U S over, you know, should you eat eggs or not? Can you eat butter or not? Is lard good for you or not? And what we're finding is of course, all of the traditional foods, all of the foods that our ancestors ate, in fact, had a really important value. And by just swapping them simply for, you know, hydrogenated oils or fake sugar substitutes, in fact, really do our bodies a disservice. And, you know, counting calories is, is one way to look at it, but really, you know, again, listening to your body, that's going to give you the best feedback, more so than any kind of um, other way to, to calculate that information. And what's really neat is now, again, we have all these metrics for figuring out, you know, how our bodies are reacting to different things. But I really feel like you were just saying, it's listening to your body and letting it speak for you. And, um, you know, people who want to learn how to make kombucha at home, they can grab our copy of our free recipe and ebook by visiting kombuchacamp.com. That's camp with a K backslash DIY. And when you're there, you can download a copy of our recipe. You also get an email a day for five days where we just kind of give you some information about kombucha. And that more than anything else has been our mission at Kombucha Camp, which is getting quality information to people so that they don't feel afraid of this process, but they're empowered by knowledge. They can um, take what our ancients have always used to keep themselves healthy and strong and bring it into the 21st century and do it themselves at home. Yeah, do you know, I'm, I'm sort of, before we go, go on to uh, listener viewer questions, and as always, there's a box right at the bottom of this page where you can um, ask Hannah, Hannah any questions that you may have. I'm all for eating real food, eating for food that looks like food, having food that doesn't have a long ingredients list because <laughs> it actually changed my life. You know, I can't say it enough. It just changed my life. So again that's why this whole message is so important for me and, and this is the way our ancestors ate so fermented foods but uh, whether it's sourdough bread or um you know the alaskans the way used to they used to preserve their fish um fermenting is really something that has 
is how our answers used to eat so it's not something that we've just made up or like you said it's just something that's in vogue now yeah absolutely i mean and um and and some of the really interesting research that's coming out too is dirt and the role that it plays in terms of keeping us healthy so like gardening um you know making mud pies all of these are really important things to do and um you know we've kind of been afraid but there are certain clays that actually help you know in the andes if the water's not drinkable they'll put some some dirt or clay into the water and that will help to mitigate the parasites present in it. So, um, you know, when we look back to how people have been doing things and we apply our modern um, research to it, we really find that there is a reason why people did things that way. And that's what's really exciting about all of the modern research and, you know, the better DNA sequencing techniques. I mean, we're finding that kombucha cultures have you know, 20 types of bacteria and maybe uh, 15 types of yeast. And while they may not be present in massive forms, they're, they're present in these trace amounts. And again, because we know so little about, you know, the different types of bacteria, I mean, we don't even have names for everything yet, and they're still figuring that stuff out, is, you know, nature has the answers. And while humans, I think, sometimes come from a good place and want to try to make things better, it's that underlying need to monetize everything that really throws us off. Because um, when we look to nature and use nature as nature has intended and leverage nature in new and novel ways, we often find things that are beneficial to many, not just a few. And so we can benefit the planet, we benefit ourselves, we benefit our local ecosystems um, by by taking back these kind of traditional ways of healing ourselves and um, and allowing ourselves to be more deeply rooted in to the planet that we live and coexist on. I mean, we are a giant symbiotic organism and nothing uh, works without, without being in harmony with something. I mean, if we take away the trees, if we take away the bees, you know, some you, we're going to have a massive extinction as a result of that because of all of the unknown and unseen and and starting to be discovered relationships between uh, the complexity of our universe. It's it's really exciting. Yeah, yeah. All all for all for using nature to its full potential and full benefits. Um. So that's wonderful. You've you've shared some fantastic information here, Hannah. Before I go on to viewer. Uh, questions is there anything that you'd like to say as a parting to kombucha and um, fermented foods and the revival a revival of it all well it's um it's something that anyone can do at any time you know there's so many options out there just pick one and start with it yeah uh, some people might be worried to work with culture so maybe making yogurt is the right place for you to start or um, water kefir because it's a very short fermentation cycle might be something that people want to start with and each of these are going to have different benefits to them so I say just get started. Pick one and start. See see what happens. See how it makes you feel. And don't be afraid to experiment. I think too often we are, uh, you know, one time it fails and so we give up. But, you know, this is, you just keep picking at it. There's a ton of resources on the internet. Not only is Kombucha Camp a great resource, we have our, our website. As you mentioned, we've got videos on our YouTube page. We also have um, a Facebook page and groups and just tons of information coming out and we're getting super creative with what we can do with these things so for instance you know kombucha is traditionally tea and sugar but we can also ferment coffee with the kombucha culture we can ferment hibiscus tea with kombucha culture you know and all of these are going to create unique and different types of ferments that you know maybe we've never experienced before so we're just at the tip of the iceberg in terms of the creativity and what's going to happen you know even with the the scoby we can eat the scoby we can um, consume it as food we can turn it into vegan leather substitute we can make jewelry out of it there are fashion designers creating you know biodegradable material out of kombucha cultures and we haven't even begun to realize that we can take those scobies and they'll soak up toxins from from toxic areas and and remove them so there's so many applications that are going to come. I, I really don't think this is a trend. I think it's the beginning of a, a new re-evolution into a, a better place, working in harmony with the planet. You know, and I actually think, I actually hope it is because it's 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 a na it's something natural. It's something that our ancestors did, and, and and clearly there's been so many success stories. It is something that's going to be more, more beneficial for us overall. Um, me personally, because of 
my whole IBS and everything, I think water kefir is probably the best for me to start with. Um, so that's the route that I'm going to go down. But um, I'm just going to look through any questions that are coming in, Hannah, from... And anyone who has questions about brewing, uh, feel free to drop us an email anytime, customer service at kombuchacamp.com. We literally answer every email that comes in, whether you purchase from us or not, because really we care about education and getting information into people's hands. I mean, imagine if you don't have to spend all day worried about being sick or trying to get better. Imagine if you can um, change that, how much energy you'd have, how much desire you'd have to go back out in your community and to help others as well. And so we really see this as people as more and more people incorporate these and they get healthy they're just going to take that energy and put it back into the places it needs to be which is our communities and our families and um, you know in and in the broader family of, of our of our world mm, makes a lot of sense really good point is there but I've got a question coming in from Alvera from the USA and she wants to know a bit more about kefir because that's another fermented food and uh, particularly coconut kefir, uh, coconut water kefir and the benefits for it? Yes, so um, coconut uh, oil, coconut water, coconut meat, all of it has really terrific healthy acids. It's high in um, magnesium and other electrolytes. It also has things like caprylic acid, which really help folks who have candida and things like that. So fermenting coconut now brings all that nutrition to, again, to the next level up. So fermentation is always going to magnify the positive benefits of whatever you're fermenting. Um, so with, uh, if you want to do a coconut water kefir, which again is really great for folks who have candida, use the water kefir grains for that. And then if you want to ferment coconut milk, um, you can use the milk kefir grains. Now, both of those grains are not going to thrive in coconut as a substrate because it doesn't have all of the nutritional elements it needs. So we'll be able to use it for a batch or two, but then we do need to put it back into its original substrate. In the case of water kefir, that's sugar water. In the case of milk kefir, that's in milk, um, raw or pasteurized, whatever you're using with it. Allow it to build up again, and then you can go back and uh, create those coconut kefirs again. And we do have a page on our website about water kefir that you can check out. And uh, more pages are coming soon on milk kefir, coconut kefir, and all that good stuff. Yeah, brilliant. And um, is that? Do you prefer one? Do you prefer um, one fermented beverage to another? Obviously, we've talked a lot about uh, kombucha, but I mean, my my week that initially started with kefir. Do you find one better than the other, or they, like you said, are they going to have different? Beneficial health benefits for you. It's true, and you know, so um, kefir, milk kefir is a lacto ferment. It's a primarily lactobacillus dominant culture. Water kefir is Zymomomus mobilis for the most part. So each culture is going to have its own kind of properties that goes with it. For me, water kefir is a little on the sweet side. So unless I um, second ferment it for a little bit longer to make it tangier, closer to the kombucha. I'm not a huge fan. But another ferment that we also have and is kind of newer is called jun or uh, rhymes with fun or jun, which is Chinese for bacteria. Basically, it looks very similar to a kombucha culture, but it feeds on raw honey and green tea traditionally. I'm sure just like the kombucha can be made with black tea, green tea, white tea, you could make your jun with other teas, but what's in important for it is that raw honey component. So raw honey has its own host of bacteria and they interact with the culture in a very specific way, such that when we do experiments with our cultures, if we do jun with sugar, it smells and tastes terrible. If we do kombucha with raw honey, it's really awful. So while some people might, you know, they're kind of like cousins, but they're they're not so closely related anymore. They're definitely discrete organisms, and it has a lighter, more floral profile. So uh, for those who prefer not to use sugar but have a great raw honey resource, that might be a good culture to try. Yeah, really but I also love things like kvass. Like beet kvass is one of my favorites because you get that little pink mustache, and it's just so easy to put chopped beets and uh, water and salt, and it's salty and I just, I really like it. Yeah. I've got another question coming in from uh, Shona from the UK. Um, and again, we, we discussed it before. Is it good for, is it, is it good for IBS? Can these be used to treat IBS? Any of both of them, you know, would, would, what, what probiotics would, which of these probiotics would be beneficial for that? 
Um, you know, tip, it depends on how severe the, the case is. If it's yeah. very severe, we suggest starting with the kefirs because they have a lot of um, organisms, a lot of bacteria that are going to help to repopulate the gut and help strengthen the gut walls. Um, kombucha also does that effect, but sometimes can be a little too intense for people right yeah. at first. So That's if you're perfect. someone who's tried kombucha and feel like, whoa, I'm getting too much of a Herxheimer reaction, maybe switch to a kefir first. Yes. And then as your immune system changes, as your gut chemistry changes, reincorporate the kombucha at a later time because it will have a different type of benefit and effect. But um, kombucha is also really great for IBS. Um, as well as constipation. And the reason it can work on so many different things is it's actually an adaptogen. So this is a term that's applied to several different types of herbs and it satisfies three qualifications, which is it's non-toxic, it's non-specific, meaning it works on the whole organism, and it has a tonifying effect that helps reduce stress. So like when we're in stress, we feel things at a much more like, like the same, you know, slap on the hand is gonna feel much more painful than if we're in a state of calm. Yes. And so when we're constantly in an activated state of stress, we perceive things much more keenly, we're more sensitive to that. And so by having a more even keel, having less stress in our lives, we can be, um, you know, the same types of things can come at us, situations, people, you know, actual stimuli, and we're better able to deal with that without, you know, causing our bodies to have cortisol overload and, and all of the attendant issues that come with that. Yeah, so I definitely think that um, water kefir is better good option if you wanted to start with that, that specific IBS because I can imagine it quite light, like you said, not heavy for people. Yeah, and people love ginger, so flavoring it with ginger. Ginger has so many great digestive properties or um, turmeric. Both of those are going to really help support the gut. So using the flavorings to your benefit is really key because um, whenever we flavor any of the fermented foods, because of the live bacteria present, they're also going to draw the nutrition from whatever you're flavoring it with. So those digestive properties of ginger are, are, again, magnified when we use them as a flavoring in any of the fermented foods because of the bacteria and the action that they, they play on them. Um, going back to that, could you use peppermint as a, as a flavoring? That's very, very good. Obviously, spasm, spasm and IBM. Yeah, exactly right. And when you know a lot about herbs, you can start to create your own flavors and formulas to specifically help support, you know, specific things in your body. Now, of course, read up on the herbology. Not all herbs can be taken by everybody all the time. So you really need to educate yourself about that. And the other thing is, um, at least with the kombucha, a little bit goes a long way. So we don't need massive quantities of flavoring in order to get the benefit or the flavor into the beverage. And, and oftentimes, if we over flavor, especially with fruit and things that are really sugary, we can lead to bottle bombs or explosions. So we do need to be conscientious that um, if we're creating something with a lot of sugar and it's the summer and warm out and we're not putting it right in the fridge that we need to be observant and make sure that nothing's getting too over carbonated such that it might lead to any damage. Yeah, yeah brilliant. That's a good tip there. Just one more question coming in and it's from Leah and she wants to know once you get started with these probiotic beverages you carry on, it will be like a way of life. Kind of. Absolutely. I mean, um, you know, we make kombucha at home. We make uh, kefir and jun. Um, you know, they oftentimes become either a substitute for other alcoholic beverages or as a complement to those beverages. You know, in fact, I have I have a little personal theory about um, these beverages is, you know, because humans evolved with fermentation, uh, the word ferment comes from the root fevere, which means to boil. And the way we could tell fermentation was occurring was because of all the little bubbles that were appearing on the surface. And it looked like the bubbles on a pot of boiling water. Well, yeast is the driver of fermentation. Yeast contains all the nutritional components components that our body really needs to feel good. So we're inherently hardwired to seek out carbonation because it signals to us that nutrition is present. Now the problem is, is when we pasteurize wine and beer, which is great on a commercial level because you stabilize the flavor, you make it easier to transport. The problem though is, is we rob those beverages of the nutrition that we're hardwired to seek. And I think that that's really what leads to an imbalance in, in overconsumption of alcohols because our body is trying to derive some kind of nutritional benefit from it that isn't present anymore. And that's why home brewing any beverages or buying local craft beverages is a great way to get that 
first of all, you get the local bacteria and yeast into your body. Uh, that helps with local allergies and things like that. But you're also supporting people who are doing a craft, who love what they're doing. They're um, bringing that nutrition to you in a really delightful and delicious way. And in fact, you end up consuming less because your body has what it needs. It has what it needs. Yeah, that's a, actually that's a really valid point. And I never even thought on what I actually read anywhere else. That makes a lot of sense. And, I, and uh, as this is purely a sound fabulous study, any pointer, any anything that you think would, you know, one one point of how viewers can actually fuel themselves, absolutely fabulous. Absolutely. Um, so uh, check us out at kombuchacamp.com, camp with a K. We got loads of information there for you. We then also have a store where we have quality supplies and products. And we also invent products to make fermentation easier and fun. And we love this lifestyle. We love the we love how excited people are getting around it, how how much energy is coming around it. And because we're bacteria powered, there's this really positive um, vibe that comes from it as we as we realize we are all connected and that um, you know we need each other to survive on this planet. Oh, that's brilliant! That's brilliant, Hannah. Thank you so much for um, coming on. And um, thank you, Sabrina. Yeah, thank you. It's been brilliant, really, really, really good. And um, thank you all for listening and joining us. And um, until my next show, yeah, it's Sabrina Khan over and out with Hannah from Fabulous TV.